morning, guys. Um, it is great to be here this morning and to know that some people are watching from their homes. Today, we're going to be looking at our second instalment of our series in Ezra and Nehemiah. So as we start this book of Ezra, um, we find the Israelites have been living in exile for over two generations. They'd abandoned God. They'd ceased to acknowledge him. God had warned them time and time again, but eventually the temple in Jerusalem, the place where God met with his people, where they were able to worship him, was destroyed and the people were exiled. But God in his goodness had a plan to redeem and restore this nation and he stirs the heart of a pagan king and the exiles are allowed to return home to rebuild their temple and restore their identity as a nation. So Mike kicked off our series last week in in chapter 1 and 2 of Ezra, um, and he was looking at the Israelites' return. So do make sure you catch up on that if you missed that at all. But today we're going to be looking at chapter 3, what the Israelites did once they returned, um, and what actually we can learn from this story today. So I wonder as a church, what does the end of lockdown mean to us? What are the things that you are looking forward to? In Ezra chapter 1, King Cyrus releases these exiles to return to their normal. It would have been very easy for them just to rush back and crack on, systematically building what they had known before. They certainly had plenty of skilled craftsmen and resources. And it kind of made me think, actually, Many of you will have heard Boris's announcement on Monday and the government's plans for our nation to begin returning to normal, whatever that looks like. And actually, how easy would it be for us now to just systematically rush back to building our normal, our old patterns and routines, even the really great ones? You know, we've done it before. We know the processes. We've got lots of skilled people. Let's just crack on. But we read in chapter 3 what the Israelites actually did first on their return before they rushed to start rebuilding. And I think there's a few really important things for us as a church to learn from this. Firstly, we read that they joined together. They acknowledged God's presence and they worshipped him. They joined together. They acknowledged God's presence and they worshipped him. We read in verses 1 to 3 that once the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with one unified purpose, to offer up burnt sacrifices to God. They had the altar rebuilt and they began to sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord each morning and night. Now, this wasn't just the Israelites having a massive barbecue. Sacrifices had been a central part of Israelites' worship for generations. Back in Exodus, God instructs Moses to build him an altar wherever he caused his name to be remembered and to offer up sacrifices to him, burnt offerings, peace offerings. The purpose of these sacrifices was to reveal a holy God who should be honoured, obeyed and worshipped and ultimately points us and points to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus. God intended these sacrifices not just to be some religious ritual, but to actually bring out true devotion of the heart. King David spoke about this heart attitude in Psalm 51. He says, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit. This was a nation united together before their God with broken spirits and repentant hearts, acknowledging him, rededicating themselves to him, worshiping and glorifying him. Half a century had gone since the temple had been destroyed, since their sin and neglect had caused God to allow this temple to be torn down. And now, returning from exile, before the foundations of the temple had even been laid, first and foremost, their priority and heart's desire was to unite together 
acknowledge the Lord and worship him. This story now might be a bit much information, but bear with me. Over the last few (laughs) weeks, I have been needing a wee constantly, like every five minutes. And apparently, Karen's laughing, is one of the side effects of pregnancy. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but sometimes if me and Jamie have been for a walk, um, the moment literally the key is turned in the lock and the door is opened, I sprint to the loo and go straight for a wee before my coat's off, shoes off, scarf's off. I'm so desperate, I've just got to go. Well, I feel like this is kind of like a picture we see in Ezra 3. A nation desperate for God. They didn't have the spirit of God dwelling among us as we do now. Their temple, the place where the presence of God dwelt on earth, was destroyed. And for over 50 years, they'd been unable to worship their God with sacrifices and access his presence. So the moment the door was open for them, they sprinted through it. And without even thinking about laying a foundation, they were going to worship their God. The rest of the temple could wait. The city wall and the protection that would offer could wait. It reminds me of one of my favorite Psalms, 127, that says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. They knew first and foremost they needed God. They were desperate for him. And if they failed to acknowledge him, the rest of the building would have been totally in vain. So church... On returning to our gatherings, we need to unite together and make it our priority to acknowledge God and worship him. Just as God was at work during the exile through characters like Daniel and Esther and Mordecai, I believe God has been at work during this past year. God has been building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We aren't having to return to rebuild because actually throughout this season, even when our buildings have closed and we've been unable to gather, God has continued to build his temple. We are his temple and he's continued adding to our number. He's continued speaking to us, meeting with us, teaching us, molding us. We've still been able to worship him and be daily fed by him. But what a celebration it will be when we can finally unite together again. But in uniting, I think there's something so important to learn from these returning exiles. When we seek to build or rebuild anything in life, whether it's ministry, relationships, family, our job is to first and foremost seek God. In all our ways, acknowledge him and offer ourselves up as living sacrifices. Then allow the Lord to build. When we worship him, when we focus on him first, it shifts everything. We're reminded who he is and who we are. We understand that he alone is sovereign and holy. We realize we can't do any of this without him. We understand just as the Israelites did, actually our deep need for God. If we seek to do anything before first acknowledging him and giving him the glory and honour he deserves, we will find our priorities all wrong. Without him, we are nothing. The Israelites had had the temple in Jerusalem for generations and slowly over the years they'd begun to grow cold to God's presence, unmoved and unteachable. They had ceased to acknowledge him and offer sacrifices to him and begun to do things their own way. God had to take it all away from them to realize just how desperate and hungry they really were. Now, unlike the Israelites, we don't need a physical temple anymore or altars. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice and now we can boldly approach the throne of God and worship him freely. His presence has never left us not even for a moment. But have we grown cold to his presence? Do we give God the honour and glory his holiness deserves? Or have we actually been doing church life, Christian life, without really acknowledging his presence or making it our priority? Perhaps God has allowed us to walk through this wilderness 
to remind us of our need and desperation for him. The other night, I felt God really challenging me. Beth, is it just me you want? Is it just my presence? Or do you actually just want what I can give to you? This is something he has to challenge me on regularly. But as I was praying into it, I felt him show me that actually this was a challenge to the whole church. That he's bringing us into a new season. But the challenge is, do we just want him? Or are we actually after what he can give to us? What he can do for us? Do we long for more of his presence? Or do we actually just long for our Sunday routines back? Do we long to spend time with him? Or do we just long for him to say yes to all our prayer requests? It reminds me of Exodus 33 when God says to Moses, okay, I'll give you the promised land. I'll deliver you there safely. I'll give you everything I've promised, but I'm not going with you. And Moses refuses. He says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The only reason Moses wanted God to go with them was to have God with them. How many of us can honestly say that? That the only reason we want God with us is purely and simply because we want God with us and anything else is completely worthless without his presence. Just imagine for a second if God said to us, okay, you can leave lockdown You can return safely to life before COVID. No more homeschooling. You can see your friends and family again. Get back to work. No more financial stresses. But I'm not going with you. Honestly, how would you respond? Are we desperate to return to a comfortable, familiar normal? Or are we desperate for God's presence? Would you respond as Moses did? If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. The Israelites would have been desperate to get back and build their city, to get the temple restored and just to get on with life again. But what they were far more desperate for was the presence of God. I feel like right at the core of what God's bringing us into will be a bride totally in love with him, desperate for him. And just like the returning exiles, all we want is him. I wonder what is the attitude and posture of your heart? Just as David said in Psalm 51, God didn't want the Israelites' sacrifices just as some religious routine. He wanted their hearts, their attention and their devotion. In the same way, I don't think there's a step-by-step formula for us to return well, because fundamentally this is a heart issue. What is your priority and desire? Does God have all your attention and all your devotion? We must choose to seek him first, to acknowledge his presence, and then offer every area of our lives as a living sacrifice in worship to him, for him to build on. So the Israelites joined together. They acknowledged God's presence and they worshipped him. Then they got on with the work. As we worship, we acknowledge God's presence. We acknowledge God in his rightful place as Lord of our lives, the one on the throne. And then every other work we do from there, everything we do, think, say and build from that place comes under his lordship. I think that's why Jesus taught us to start praying with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jamie spoke more on that during our prayer course. But I read in my notes the other day, everything in existence is most accurately described only in its relationship to the throne of God. We learn to view life far more accurately when we learn to view it increasingly through the vantage point of the one who spoke it into existence. Only then can things be viewed with dependable accuracy and boundless hope. I believe God is beginning to release fresh perspective in his church, viewing things through the vantage point of his glory and his holiness and filling us with a deep desire to worship him. 
This passage from Habakkuk 3 has come up a number of times. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. I love that even once the Israelites start work on the temple, the moment the foundation has been laid, this big worship celebration breaks out. Trumpets are blown, cymbals clashed, songs of God's goodness and faithful love are sung. I mean, if I'd been there, honestly, I probably would have thought, guys, come on, if we carry on like this, this is literally going to take forever. But the thing is, they were filled with such an awareness of the glory of the Lord and his holiness. They arrived home and they worshipped. They laid the foundation and they worshipped. Every step was laced in an acknowledgement of God's presence. God was on his throne and they were going to praise him and acknowledge his goodness in every piece of work they did. As we gather together again for the work God has for us, as we seek to build up and strengthen one another, to build his kingdom here on earth, I pray that it would be laced with an acknowledgement of the Lord, putting him in his rightful place and seeking him first. So the Israelites join together. They acknowledge God's presence. They worship him. They get on with their work and they worship him some more. But right at the end of this passage, we find a little warning. Verse 12 says, Whilst all the shouting and praising was going on, many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. Now, it's not totally clear from this passage why the elders were weeping. It's not particularly clear whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Perhaps they were weeping in repentance over the sin that caused the first temple to be destroyed. Perhaps they remember the tangible glory of the Lord they'd sensed in that, in that place 50 years ago. Perhaps they got swept up in all the excitement and expected something much bigger and more glorious. However, we can look at what the prophets Haggai and Zechariah spoke into this very situation. And we actually discover that they are warning the elders against this response. Haggai 2, 9 says, The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Zechariah 4, 9 to 10 says, The rubber bell is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. We're going to look more at the key role these prophets played in the next couple of weeks, in a couple of weeks' time. But this was clearly a challenge that these elders needed to hear. The problem was they were looking back, glorifying the past instead of glorifying their God. Had all their hope and expectation been over just seeing a big glorious temple restored rather than having their hope and expectation in the God who had carried them this far? They didn't have the vision to see what it would be. They couldn't understand the full picture. My Glaswegian gran had this saying, fools and burns should never see things half done. It basically means it's foolish to judge something, some work before it's finished. And I think there's real wisdom in taking these warnings from Zechariah and Haggai and the wise words of my gran. Now is not the time for us to look back or to judge half-done work, half work. There might be a huge sense of expectation as we regather, but we need to be careful not to look back and expect what was there before to just reappear. God is up to something new. Let's not be discouraged as we look at the new thing God is in the process of building. Most of the returning exiles were experiencing such joy and celebration because this was exactly what they'd been longing for. Others missed out on that joy because they couldn't see past the past. Let's not let looking back steal our attention and our worship, but let's rejoice and seek God for what he's doing now. Let's not look at the new work in process and despise these small beginnings. 
See, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? Let's seek God for the vision to see the full picture of what he's doing. When I was praying into this series a few weeks back, I felt God gave me the word regenerate. So I googled it and it said, having new and more vigorous life, revived. It reminded me of a picture I had right at the start of the first lockdown, almost a year ago now, of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. God transforming his bride into something even more beautiful. I believe God is regenerating his church, giving us new and more vigorous life as he revives and renews us. This isn't about looking back and simply returning to what, God has, gone, what has gone before. God has done some amazing things in this church, in this parish and in this community over the years. And I've so loved hearing stories about the way the Spirit has moved in the past. Stories of revivals and miracles. But he is not finished. And in fact, he's never stopped. He is doing a new thing. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on where God might be leading us as a church because I'm too busy longing for what's gone before. Back at the beginning of last year, we had a staff and subcommittee day away and God gave me that passage in Haggai about the future glory of the temple being greater than the former. At the time, I didn't realize the weight of what it would mean, but I knew it was for us. And actually, Trudy had the same pass shared the same passage at Dwell last week. I totally believe that the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past. I believe that God is doing something new and glorious in his church. But I also believe it will happen in his way and at his pace. Let's look for the ways God might be regenerating and renewing us for fresh encounters of his spirit and a move of God like we've never seen before. Let's rejoice in what God is doing now and worship him because no matter what this new season looks like, we can trust that God is good and his faithful love endures forever. This is going to take every one of us seeking him daily, making time each day to acknowledge his presence and offering ourselves up as living sacrifices. There will be challenges and changes, but I feel like before we rush on, before we simply return to our normal ways, patterns and routines, let's seek the heart of God. Let's spiritually build an altar before God, acknowledging before him that we will not forget this place, this season he's led us through. That we won't forget all he's taught us, all he has revealed to us and challenged us on. The things we've had to repent of, the things he's reminded us of. And let's lay our lives on the altar of sacrifice as worship, giving him the glory and honor his presence deserves. Let's pray.